we're going to go ahead and get started uh, to do this session today. Um, uh, for Real Estate Development 101. Uh, my name is Lisa Much. I'm Communications and Capacity Building Director for the Ohio CDC Association. Um, as I said, this session is being recorded. If you registered for this meeting, uh, you're going to get a copy of it. Um, we're also going to post it uh, to our website so you'll have access to it. You can find it. Um, so it'll be good. Um, I think you're all muted now, and that's to help with background noise. If you have a question throughout, there's tons of time for questions. Um, type it in the chat, and we're going to get through it throughout the session. Um, it's unlikely we'll be unmuting folks later. Um, so yeah, if you can put it in the chat, that would be super awesome. Um, and then I just wanted to say before we dig really deeply in today's session, this is Real Estate Development 101. So it's intended for community development organizations with limited development experience or new hires, new to the field. It's, it's for beginners. And we're going to start with a lot of basics. So as we go through, please ask questions, right? There are no bad, there are no stupid questions today. Like this is, you're getting it, the 101 level. If you happen to be more experienced and you signed up anyway, that's great. You're welcome. Totally stay. We are going to hold another session next month on May 18th, uh, Real Estate Development 401. That might be a little bit more geared towards you if you're more experienced. Um, and there'll be information coming out about that later. You can also find it on our event stuff right now on our website. Okay. Now that all of that is said, um, I am super excited to uh, introduce and welcome Jeff Mormon of the Finance Fund today to lead the session. Uh, he is the Executive Vice President of Real Estate at Finance Fund, which is a statewide nonprofit community development entity that moves public and private capital into low to moderate income communities to improve the quality of life for people. Jeff helps to promote Finance Fund's real estate initiatives through his extensive experience in the areas of real estate business and community development, since 2011, he has developed over 175 affordable housing units, including home ownership, tax credit projects, both low income and historic, senior multifamily rental, supportive recovering, and adult care facility housing. Uh, additionally, Jeff has acquired and renovated more than 150,000 square feet of commercial and community facility space throughout 12 counties in central and southeast Ohio. Jeff has managed and directed every aspect of real estate development from acquisition to placed in service, including all pre-development activities, construction, management, lease up, and sales. And so again, as you have questions, uh, please type them in the chat um, and we will get to them. But for now, I wanna pass it over to Jeff. All right, thanks Lisa. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I appreciate everyone taking a little time out of their morning to, to be a part of this session and to, to listen to some, I don't know, hopefully some good advice from me on uh, how to start um, how to start in real estate. Um, so I will, I'll start a little bit with, with Finance Fund. Finance Fund, uh, as Lisa said, nonprofit organization statewide. Uh, I think it turns 34 years old. Um, it was started in 1987, um, and it, it was uh, has had a, a few different roles as an organization since uh, since it began. But uh, as of now, and I'll, I'll go to the next slide, it really is uh, an organization that does a lot of uh, different, I think, um, good work throughout the state. Um, I think maybe a lot of you have worked with Finance Fund or partnered with us. We have invested in uh, 85 of the 88 counties in Ohio. Um, and, and most of those investments have come through small businesses, uh, nonprofit organizations, community action agencies, CDCs. So uh, there's a chance that many of you on this call have um, engaged with and, and maybe even received funding from Finance Fund at, at one time or another. So uh, to tell you a little more about Finance Fund, it's a financial intermediary. You know, what that means um, is really we take public dollars, private dollars, including our own funds, and invest in communities uh, throughout the state. And you know, typically that's in 
low to moderate income communities or it serves low to moderate income individuals and families. Um, so, you know, we have provided new market tax credits, uh, both the state and federal level um, in high distressed areas. Um, we support small businesses um, and have a lot of uh, supports in the last year that we've deployed through uh, funds that we received um, to help uh, offset some of the negative impacts of the pandemic. Um, we provide new mark, uh, excuse me, uh, pre-development economic development grants uh, through the Ohio Housing Trust Fund. Um, and uh, we have most recently, and what I'm here to talk about, uh, got involved in real estate uh, investment development. Um, and that really has started since I joined Finance Fund in July of 2018. Uh, so it, that is a, a newer component of what we've done and what we do. Um, uh, and I don't know, actually, I apologize. I don't think I mentioned this. We also are a, uh, a lender um, through the Finance Fund Capital Corporation. So that is called a CDFI, a certified um, community development financial institution. Uh, we provide flexible capital, um, community-based nonprofits and for-profit businesses, um, primarily focused on community facilities, uh, residential, um, healthy foods, um, some small business work as well. Uh, and, and we're really trying to be a lender and fit into a niche where you know, you can't just go to the larger bank and, and get that loan. Um, you know, maybe maybe there's credit issues, maybe it's the location. You know, we, we provide those funds where, you know, other entities may not be able to. Um, and so, you know, so in that way, we are certainly flexible. And uh, for the most part, uh, you know, I think our money is, is really excellent for most projects. Um, there are some instances where, you know, there are better terms and rates out there, but Certainly for those that are struggling maybe to get um, bridge financing or some of the startup capital for their business or development entity, you know, we can uh, certainly fill those gaps. Um, and I think with really competitive and excellent rates. So that's that's Finance Fund Capital Corporation. Uh, those are both uh, 501c3. So it's actually two entities, but um, they roll up to the same board. Uh, on the finance fund real estate side, and this is exciting and uh, very recent, we have a three-person team now, um, which uh, is is makes my heart very happy. Uh, so I started in July of 18 and uh, just kind of hustled um, to try to get projects started and off the ground. Uh, and then recently we've hired David Petroni. Um, he's vice president of real estate development. He uh, comes with 30 years of experience, has worked at OFA, uh, other for-profit developers, uh, has been um, a consultant and, and worked in projects, um, I think in 20 some states. So uh, extensive tax credit experience and development experience. Uh, and then we also hired uh, Randy Arnett. Um, I'm sure you in Columbus would know her. Uh, she worked under Rita Paris uh, in the city of Columbus uh, housing office. Um, on the uh, home ownership side. Uh, she uh, came over, uh, just both of them, David and Randy just came over in the last six weeks. So really excited to have uh, a three person team now uh, with the support of certainly all the other finance fund staff, but uh, it, is, it is really exciting. And I think um, hopefully that allows us to continue to do some really fun and interesting projects that uh, impact uh, communities throughout Ohio. So uh, before we get into um, all the services we provide, I wanna take a minute and, and talk uh, a little bit about myself um, and I'll try not to bore everyone with my details. Um, I uh, am a licensed attorney, came out of Ohio State in 2008. Uh, great time to, to graduate from law school as uh, many of my friends were losing their offers and, and many others were unable to uh, attain uh, employment uh, at all uh, for a period of time with the economic crash that happened uh, right at that time. Um, it was a, a, a difficult moment for me as well. Uh, I was able to secure a job, uh, but within six months, uh, that firm was no longer able to pay me. Uh, I stayed on for a while trying to 
hoping things would turn around, but uh, ended up landing in a neighborhood called Franklinton, which is on the near west side of downtown Columbus. Uh, it is literally just across the river from what's considered downtown. Uh, Kosai, uh, Vets Memorial, those are all in the peninsula area of Franklinton that extends about two and a half miles west of downtown. Uh, when I uh, moved in there, uh, in 2008, uh, I, I was uh, was drawn by who, uh, someone is now my wife, uh, Heather, and she was telling me about uh, what it meant to live among the poor and to try to serve in ways that would be impactful to uh, the individuals uh, in that community and had uh, recruited uh, a dozen other families uh, to move down as well and um, to buy homes and invest in small businesses and uh, community uh, engagements, uh, organizations, and, and really kind of just be uh, a part of this neighborhood. So I loved everything they were about. Uh, and I was able to move in uh, at a time of, of truly kind of desperate need uh, into an apartment um, that cost $100 a month. Um, can't really find those much anymore anywhere, but you can imagine the condition of the facility, <laughs> uh, the building I was in, uh, where they were charging $100 a month, uh, you know, you get what you pay for. But what was really cool is to experience um, what it meant to have economic distress and to live in a, a lower income community while doing so. Um, and honestly, the biggest distinguishing feature between me and many of my neighbors and current neighbors, we still live here, um, 13 years later, uh, is that there was a level of ability for growth that um, many of my neighbors didn't have because of, of connections that I had made throughout my life and uh, the education that I had. So, you know, it was a very different experience for me, even at that time, knowing that, you know, my status in life, my, you know, where I was in my life and my mid twenties was a temporary thing, uh, you know, and that I was going to have uh, support and help to to move to that next phase of life. So, you know, that was certainly eye opening for me. Um, flash forward three years, I was finally able to get um, a type of job that I wanted and cared about. And so, in um, April, actually, of two thousand eleven. Uh, I started with the Franklinton Development Association working under Jim Sweeney. Um, and I felt like uh, at that moment, much of what I had experienced and what I cared about and what I thought I believed in kind of came together. And I got to be a community developer. I got to get into housing and uh, get connected to what was happening in this, you know, this community that while it was up and coming, certainly needed a ton of support. And it was really exciting. Um, I didn't know anything. Uh, I really had no clue what it meant to, to engage in real estate, to sell real estate, to build real estate, to understand plans, um, to know what type of services I needed to engage in, uh, to help potential buyers or tenants, what the funding sources looked like. Didn't, I didn't know anything. I, uh, I think I got lucky. Jim thought maybe I could figure it out. And, um, and he gave me really a lot of uh, autonomy to, to try to do that. Um, so a lot of very long uh, nights trying to figure out what a, a pro forma looked like, what, what the funding sources required. Um, and it was, it was a very interesting, stressful, uh, exciting time. And so that was, that was April, 2011. And then if any of you have worked with the Federal Home Loan Bank, one of the first things I did was have to submit a closeout for their funding, which is a, you know, it can be a tedious process. You need to have all of your, uh, your items in line and make sure that you know what you're submitting is accurate and uh, is is supported by the documents. And um, they were so gracious with us and, and me specifically, because I didn't know what I was doing. I don't know how many submissions back and forth I had, but that was quite the learning experience of how of figuring out how to make the numbers balance 
uh, and provide the supports necessary to do that. So started off selling single family homes, moved on to um, doing some community facilities. We built our first office space. We did it without ever going through any zoning procedure. It was back in a time in Franklinton where quite frankly, if you were willing to invest in the neighborhood, people looked the other way or at least helped you uh, correct whatever wrongs you had made. Um, so we renovated a building, put a sign on the building, didn't pull any permits, um, any zoning uh, certificates for, for any of that work. Um, <laughs> you know, it was, it was a different time then. Uh, then we got lucky and acquired a building. Uh, the mayor of Columbus uh, gifted us $900,000. We acquired a warehouse that um, had been sitting with a former shoe factory, converted that into the largest maker space. Um, actually in the United States by square footage. Uh, and it's still um, still in operation today. It's the Idea Foundry. Um, phenomenal organization, great group, beautiful, beautiful building. Um, but that was that was the end of my tenure at uh, FDA after four years and, and quite a few single family renovations, some apartments and a couple tax credits, and then these community facilities. Um, and then moved to start um, a affordable housing program for a behavioral health company out of Athens that worked in 12 counties uh, from Columbus down to the Ohio River. Uh, and that is, again, I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know what it meant to, to start an organization uh, within an organization. I didn't know what it meant to, to do larger scale real estate developments um, across more than one neighborhood, let alone multiple counties. Um, so I was very lucky to, to have that position and, and to learn and grow with organization that had enough capital to let me make some mistakes and, and figure things out along the way. Um, and uh, did that for a few years. And then finally, uh, we were gifted a hospital, uh, a, a hospital that was closing down from Ohio Health in Nelsonville, Ohio, one of these um, county community hospitals across the country that they're all shutting down and, and no services are, are provided in those communities any further. Ohio Health didn't do that. They were building a, a new facility, um, a smaller pared down facility, but staying in the, in the community and didn't want to just demo this historic building. And so they, they had a meeting and uh, my boss and I went to it and said, yeah, we'll, we'll take this building on with no plan, no capital. And, no idea what we do with it. And we turned it into a, a 70,000 square foot health center, um, residential inpatient for, um, for youth that are um, needing high touch um, inpatient care. Uh, uh, FQHC became the primary uh, care facility there. We did some urban gardening and some other things. And in that process, uh, it was actually financed on uh, capital corporation who provided the loan to this to this project. Um, they did it without an appraisal and they did it 100% loan to cost. And um, it was a unique scenario, certainly, but working through that process with Finance Fund was, was just amazing. Um, it allowed us to get this project done, which is still uh, in operation today, is, is really successful and impactful to the community of Nelsonville. And uh, it was at that point that, uh, they started talking about creating a real estate development and investment arm for uh, for finance fund and i was lucky enough for that opportunity and uh, that's uh, where i am today so that's certainly plenty about me um but you know it is it is really through those experiences that um you know i think i can talk with some level of intelligence on on the very basics of what it means to create a development arm what it means to create a successful development project um, and to talk briefly about all the different funding sources that um, can be used to create those projects. So with that, uh, let's get into the services of what Finance Fund does uh, and what our team does. You know, planning and development, technical assistance, financial modeling, marketing. I mean, everything that, uh, that would be a part of real estate development from concept and the dream stage all the way up through uh, the annual reporting of, you know, and the asset management of a, 
of the units that are placed in service. Um, you know, and we do that both for ourselves, we do that in partnership with others. We actually provide consulting and technical assistance to third party organizations. Um, and certainly are always looking for new partnerships and, and willing to share lessons learned. So it's, you know, it's meetings like this that we're really excited to, to go through the process and uh, tell others what, you know, what mistakes we've made and, and what to watch out for. And, you know, maybe where there's ways to create some great success. So since, since July of 2018, we have uh, begun uh, 11 different real estate projects with over 120, it's at over 125 million in investments and over 700 housing units. Um, so we've been busy. And uh, I, I think, knock on wood, the projects are impactful and good for the communities. Um, they're varied in terms of our, who we're serving uh, and how we're serving them. And uh, it has been well received by the communities and our, our partners. Uh, you know, we've done everything from single family land trust homes uh, in Franklinton, actually, up to uh, mid rise, you know, 100 plus unit developments in um, urban areas in Columbus and Cincinnati. Um, one project we're working on right now, and I, I'd love to talk about this at length. Uh, and, I think we will in detail in the 401 class is um, a project called Vera on Broad. It's, it's downtown Columbus, uh, just a little east of Broad and High. It was a historic uh, 1920 office building that had for the last 30 years housed one of the larger law firms in Columbus and they were moving uh, over to Grandview and um, many developers had looked at this building and the land associated with it and most had passed because they they found it to be quite frankly not worth their time to try to struggle through how to make the numbers work um, but we took that as a great opportunity to figure out if there's a way to do a true and I, and I think a lot of people say workforce housing I think that's a complete misnomer uh, a, a middle income housing project it's the meat of the bell curve, 60 to 120% AMI, with pushing as many of those rents down into the 60 to 80% range. Um, in downtown Columbus, there actually is a, a distinction between market rents and 60 to 80% rents. Um, you know, that, that's probably 20% delta uh, on the, the rent per unit. So, you know, it is a meaningful and impactful project if you can get it done. Uh, getting it done without subsidy. Uh, seemingly seemed impossible, but we, uh, knock on wood, we are on, on target to do that. And if we can keep our rents where we're targeting right now, we would have 80% of our units at or below 80% AMI with an average rent of 76% AMI. Uh, and that's an 114 unit project uh, with a three story parking garage and five stories of apartments above, plus the renovation of the historic office building. Uh, so really exciting deal, um, not the type of project that, you know, I would say most uh, entities would be able to do, uh, you know, Finance Fund is a pretty well capitalized organization. So we're able to take a little larger risk and, and, and secure some bigger loans. Um, and, and even with that, we had to partner with much a much larger organization um, to make that work. So, you know, those are the types of deals that we think are incredibly impactful. And I think hopefully highlights a little bit of, of what we're able to accomplish. Um, the other projects I want to highlight before we get into um, the kind of the nuts and bolts of, of what real estate development even looks like is a project called Carol Stewart Village. Carol Stewart was a mentor of mine, a uh, matriarch of what is modern day Franklinton, um, helped create the area commission, which we've used all zoning permits and other community uh, issues uh, and was on the board of every nonprofits um, uh, in the neighborhood at one time or another. Uh, incredibly well educated, although not with any degrees. Um, incredibly well read and passionate person who actually helped save the uh, Central High School, which became COSI. Um, and at uh, her passing, which was almost a decade ago now, uh, Mayor Coleman 
uh, provider of the eulogy. So someone that had made a huge impact in the community and we wanted to find a way to honor her. And uh, I think we did with a pretty, uh, pretty unique project. There was two hotels on the west edge of Franklinton that have been, had been historically um, a blight on the community, uh, prostitution, human trafficking, drug runs, um, violence uh, were common uh, at this at this facility and had many nuisance uh, suits against it from the city, but going through the court system and actually taking a property, you know, shutting it down, taking the property, converting it to new use uh, is an incredibly long um, and tiresome process. Um, but the pressure put on the owner by the uh, city prosecutor they decided to sell the property and uh, we uh, we bought it with really, again, no plan in place other than first we wanted to shut down the activity that was there and we thought we were buying an asset that was in pretty good shape. So we acquired these two um, 1970s construction, you know, single story prefab, you know, built offsite, stuck together there with a roof put on top um, buildings and when we got in there, we realized that um, they were in much worse shape than our um, inspections had shown and for a few different reasons. So we ended up um, raising a lot of funding, uh, partnering with a group called Starhouse and converted the, the uh, four of the seven buildings into 62 units of housing for uh, homeless and at-risk homeless uh, youth, 18 to 24 year olds, uh, primarily coming out of the foster system. Uh, so we have every wraparound service, every social support you can imagine on site or adjacent to the property. Um, and now as of uh, actually a couple of weeks ago, we've secured 62 uh, project-based uh, vouchers for these units. So. Uh, they're small, they're 286 square feet, uh, they're efficiency apartments, they have uh, a functioning and, and uh, kitchenette, I mean a full kitchen in terms of it has cooking and um, uh, microwave, hot plate, uh, refrigerator, a full bathroom, uh, some storage, and then uh, a living space that's, you know, it's tiny, but for someone at that age and coming from you know, typically off the street where they don't have a lot of possessions and this is their first true apartment, it's a great um, you know, first step in their life to, to maybe um, help them with you know, all of the different issues that come with being homeless and being homeless at such a young age. So you know, it is a, an ongoing um, uh, trial. We, ha we hadn't seen anything done like this. This wasn't a tax credit deal. It was a lot of philanthropic efforts, uh, some some government sources, Federal Home Loan Bank, uh, but a lot of um, charity, quite frankly, from uh, individuals and corporations and um, just a lot of, of, of time and effort uh, from many individuals to make that happen. So that's Carol Stewart Village. We feel like that's a project that honors uh, her name and uh, is a project we really are excited to share. So. Uh, jumping ahead now, oh, let's 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 get into the meat and bones of of real estate developments. Um, certainly at the um, I think the introductory level. So, what is real estate developments, and uh, what is it not? So, you know, development is taking either land or an existing building and um, renovating it either to preserve what is there uh, or to convert it into something else. Right. So it's uh, it can be new construction, it can be renovating a uh, office space or warehouse to continue those uses. It can be a, called an adaptive reuse, which is taking, you know, maybe taking a, a school and converting those into apartments. Um, one of our partners just uh, completed that project down in Lancaster and it's beautiful. Um, you know, so it can be any, anything that is uh, an investment of time and capital to preserve, uh, to preserve real estate. And that can be uh, done uh, to maintain long-term ownership. That can be done as a consultant for other owners. Uh, that can be done to uh, buy and flip the property um, or some some timing within that. Like there's, you know, it, it, real estate is 
as much about finance as it is about anything else. Um, you know, and I, I think that the most creative projects are the ones that financially can be impactful uh, for the residents or tenants that will be there, as well as the investors uh, and owners of the project. And, you know, if you can create win-win scenarios, you're, you're, you're doing pretty well. So, you know, what is phase one of development? And it really is the concept. It's the idea. It's the, man, wouldn't this be great if we had, you know, an apartment complex on this vacant land? Or wouldn't it be great if we could tear down this dilapidated building and convert it into a community garden? You know, it, it can be anything along those lines. Um, you know, and it's, there's going to be far more concepts than we'll ever see as ongoing operations, right? It is, it's your first screening process to determine whether or not a project even makes sense. Um, you know, I kind of think about it in the, the terms of the, the, the smell test. So, you know, is it something that you feel like can be impactful for a community? And quite frankly, before you think it could even be financed or how it would be financed or what the economic impact would be, you know, you, you want to think of it almost from the ethical, moral concerns. You know, how, how does this impact the community or the people that um, would be a part of this? So, you know, thinking of the, the Carroll Stewart Village project, you know, our first thought was, our concept was, well, let's take the building out of operation. That was, that was a win. That was the first step to creating then what the next concept would be, what the next uh, use of those buildings would be. And then the pre-development phase, um, and I'm going to separate the pre-development into the pre-development and pre-construction phase. So pre-development is typically uh, bifurcated by pre-acquisition and then post-acquisition. So um, you know you have an idea, you want to you want to secure this land. The first work you're going to do on a building or on a on a piece of land is determine a few things. And I think I've got some slides on this. Um, uh, on, on site identification, site evaluation. So, you know, all of these things kind of go together. It's, it's going to be, well, who are the partners going to be? Um, you know, what, what is the, what is the purpose of this? Who do you need at the table? Um, you know, what, what kind of community support do you need? What contacts do you have? You know, what vendors would you typically use? You know, and if you're just starting out, you know, let's let's say you're just trying to build a single family house, right? The, the one thing you're going to look for is, well, what's the zone? You know, is there is there a use that you can build on this land that is compatible with the laws and regulations in place? And if not, can you change that zoning to make it fit what you want to do? You know, that's going to be one thing. The next thing is going to be, well, I, I want to build a single family house, but can I power the house? Can I get water to the house? Can I get sewer to the house? Um, you know, that, that was going to be, you know, a part of the civil conversation. So you, you might be engaging a civil engineer for some of that work to do an evaluation. And then you're going to look at the land itself and say, is the, is the building sufficient to build this building on, right? Is it, uh, is it rocky and, and hilly and, uh, or is it sandy? You know, what is the condition of the land itself? Um, you know, a lot of times in the urban neighborhoods, especially in the last 10 years through the, uh, I think it's the NIT program, uh, there's been a ton of homes, lighted homes that have been demolished. Well, when those homes are demolished, the land looks great afterwards, but many times that land isn't, isn't sufficient to be built on without additional supports. So you're, you're gonna look at soil testing. Um, and look at the condition of the soil itself. Uh, you know, something else you're going to look for is, well, is there some type of environmental contamination on the site? What was the use there before? You know, certainly in an urban neighborhood, you know, a row of single family houses and there's, there's a house or, you know, that's missing, there's some vacant land on a, on a street. Most likely that was always have been housing, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe 50, 60 years ago, there was a gas station on that site. And maybe in that time period, after the gas station was removed, no one ever looked at that and these new homes were built and actually the land is contaminated. Um, there's a higher end community here in Columbus that is dealing with some of that right now. Um, it's amazing actually how many times there have been landfills that have been discovered. Um, 
that nobody knew about that had been there a hundred plus years ago and homes were built on that. Um, you know, so you, you might have environmental contaminations and that can create vapors into the building that can make people sick, that can uh, contaminate the water sources and the water table um, and can create substantial liability to the owner, even if that owner had nothing to do with what happened on that land previously. So you'll want to go get you know, at least a uh, phase one, as they call it, environmental assessment. And that's, you know, that's another type of um, entity. Sometimes the, the vendors can do all of that. Some vendors will do everything from soil testing to um, environmental testing to some of the civil work as well. Sometimes those are different organizations. You know, so those are, those are things you're gonna look at right off the bat. Um, and it's okay if the answer is no. I mean, one of the, one of the best friends you're gonna have is, is the word no. Uh, we have a, a good development partner. Um, he's a converted attorney like myself, um, a little bit older, has been doing this uh, probably a decade more than me. And uh, I don't know how many different deals he's done now, but you know, his comment to me is always, you could have 20 great deals, but if you have one bad deal, that could be the end of it. Uh, there's so much, you know, depending on the size, there's so much risk on these projects. If you make a major misstep, in the development process, uh, you, you, you could really uh, have some financial harm. So you know, doing this due diligence, going through uh, after you've identified the site, you know, doing all of this pre-development work and doing it honestly, not on your own, you know, bring in those partners early. And if you have the capital that you can pay for that right off the bat and do it, if not, you know, look to organizations like, like Finance Fund, Capital Corporation or others, um, that can provide some bridge financing, some pre-development financing to, to help uh, organizations cover that cost. So they're not coming out of you know, their, their operating um, budget or their reserves to, to pay for these site costs that you know, may or may not quite frankly go anywhere. So uh, you know, those, are, those are important first steps. You know, if it's an existing building, you, know, you have a whole nother set of concerns. What's the What's the condition of the structure? You know, is there environmental concerns in that building? Uh, is there lead or asbestos? You know, certainly buildings before, built before um, in, in the early 70s and before, you know, lead is a serious, is a serious concern. Um, and you know, depending on, and you really never know uh, where asbestos could be hiding in a building. It could be in the mastic, it could be in different um, tape uh, on drywall, you know, it could be in the plaster itself or in the tile floors, um, on the roof, in the insulation, you know, there's, uh, uh, on the siding itself, asbestos uh, was used, um, was a very, very effective um, uh, construction um, tool and, and it was in many materials uh, because of its effectiveness. It turns out it causes cancer. Uh, they didn't know that clearly when they were doing that 80, 90 years ago. Uh, so it's in a lot of materials that you, know, you can't just visually inspect and say, oh yeah, that's not asbestos. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you'll, you'll want to go get those tests as well. You know, and again, that's, that's a whole nother uh, consultant or vendor. So, you know, the pre-development phase of development is, is huge and incredibly important. Um, and that most of the time, most of that work you want to happen before you acquire the property. And, and those are gonna be contingencies in any type of contract. So, and I, and I actually said this, even before you get to that pre-development phase, you're gonna to wanna to have site control. And the person that owns the site or the person that has control of the site really dictates everything going forward. If you have a dream and you wanna do this and you do all of this inspection on a property and everything else and the property looks great and you wanna move forward, but you have no ability to take ownership of that land or that building, all of that comes to, to nothing. There's no, there's, it's just waste. It was time and cost and for nothing. So the very first thing you wanna do is have a written agreement upon which you can execute. So, you know, not just a, a verbal, not a handshake, yeah, maybe it's a buddy, it's a friend that's selling this property. It's not good enough when it comes to real estate. And you can be as friendly as you want to be, but there are so many terms and so many things to consider when you're acquiring a property that you want to write it down and make sure there's a 
meeting of the minds. You know, that that is, I've seen that too many times where they're like, oh yeah, they're willing to sell us this property at X. And then six months later, by the time you've spent all of this capital, you know, they've, they've talked to a couple other people. Now they think it's worth X plus. And, you know, well, maybe the numbers don't work anymore. Um, and in this market and in some of these neighborhoods like Franklinton, um, the rising value of land and buildings is so rapid that you could see five to 10% appreciation in a month. And it, I mean, it's, it's happened, you know, I mean, land in this community is, is insane. I mean, it, it truly is like we're, we sold a piece of property that's valued at $1.5 billion per acre now. I mean, that, you know, five years ago, you may have gotten 350,000 for that acre. So it is, it's, it's just an entirely different world. There's a lot of cash. There's a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines. Um, so never, you know, never just rely on upon a friendship to, to try to acquire a property. Make sure you write down um, all of the terms and conditions, all of the contingencies that allow you to walk away from a property and know exactly how much you're gonna pay and when that closing is going to happen. Um, so that's all part of the pre-development phase, the pre-construction phase, which I didn't learn about um, quite frankly until much later in my career, um, you know, I didn't really know how to distinguish that. Um, is really the the design phase of the project, and this is where the architects and um, structural and civil engineers become incredibly important. Um, you know, maybe you've acquired the property now, and now you actually have to design what exactly you're going to build uh, and. Yeah, yes, the soil looked like it was good. You, could, you, you figure you can build something, but what exactly you're going to build is, is the next phase. Um, one example we have, we have a, a 40 unit multifamily um, component of a tax credit deal here in the neighborhood. And we stuck 40 units and 12 parking spaces on less than a half acre of land. Um, from the sidewalk, you can pretty much reach out and touch the building, right? We, we took every inch of that land we could um, and we redesigned it from the time we owned that land we re redesigned the, the project 20 different times to figure out what what we could fit on there what we could uh, afford to fit on there what we needed to fit on there to be able to generate the, the revenue to pay for the debt you know all of those things and it, you go through all these ideations until you come up with something that one will, will can be built on the land and two is is worth building. So, you know, that's that's all in this pre-construction phase. And um, if there's any tip I would say when it comes to that, make sure you build in a budget for those revisions so that the architect and you have a meeting of the minds of saying, yeah, I'm not just gonna take your first design. I wanna come back to you. And I wanna come back to you as many times as I want until I'm comfortable with what we're building. Um, and, you know, you're going to pay for those services because at some point they need to move on to the next project. But at the same time, both you and the architect want to come to an agreement on what that is going to cost mm -hmm. to do it. So, you know, those are those are some of the items that, you know, some people might call pre-development. I, I really see as a pre-construction phase. Um, other parts of pre-construction and that become really important depending on the community or the city in which you're building. Um, is variances required. So you may have the proper zoning, right? You know, the base zoning, it's, it's zoned for apartments, but apartments have to be, you know, there's, you can only have so many apartments on a piece of land, the, the building can only be so high, you know, you have to have so many parking spaces per unit, et cetera, you know, and those are the types of things that you're gonna want to request variances for once you have designed the building that you want. That's where the community leadership and community partnerships uh, come in on the front end. So when you're talking about, you know, the partners that you're going to bring to the table, you want that local CDC, you want that local nonprofit, that business organization, um, you know, that experienced developer or uh, former council person or, you know, whatever to, to really be able to be there to advocate for you. Someone that can speak you know, on behalf of people that aren't from the community and say, no, we, we vetted these individuals, we vetted this, this project, this company, 
and we believe in it and we should support it. You know, that it can be attorneys that, that, you know, oftentimes you want to look to the community and try to build that partnership and that collaboration as soon as possible once you know what you're, you're going to build. So uh, going back um, then after the pre-construction is obviously the construction. Um, you know, that that is incredibly important uh, thing to know on the front end, how much is it going to cost and how long is it going to take to build, right? The, the idea of price per square foot. So how big is the building and how much is that, that one foot, that square foot going to cost you to build is incredibly important. On a single family house, it's, you know, 1200 square feet, you know, a little shift here or there might not seem like a lot of money and maybe it can be absorbed in the rental rates or the, or the sales price. But, you know, you talk about a 40,000 square foot building and you're off by $5 a square foot, you know, you're, you've now just had a $200,000 change order or your, your, your capital stack, which we'll talk about next, is off by a couple hundred grand. So as you're designing this, you want to get the feedback of contractors. Um, you know, whether or not you're hiring a third party to give you those estimates, you're bringing the contractor in on the front end, you know, those, those are incredibly important components. So all of that then goes to the capital stack. And um, I had been in the industry for eight years before I ever heard the phrase capital stack. And in fact, I was talking to you, I was saying this to someone the other day uh, who had been in the, in the development world longer and honestly didn't know what I was talking about. Um, you know, in affordable housing, that is not a phrase that I had ever heard before uh, in market rate housing and commercial development. It's, it's kind of the way things are looked at. Uh, capital stacks can be anything from one to two sources of funds up to, in our case, like Carroll Stewart Village, we have 18 different sources of funding. Um, you know, and it's uh, incredibly important that at the end of the day, the amount of sources equals the uses for the project. So you want to make sure that however much money it's going to cost, you have raised that much money. Um, and that can be through debt, equity, grants, um, you know, and really subsets of, of all of those. Um, you know, that equity can come from cash from partners. It can be um, deferred developer fees. It can be equity raised to the sale of tax credits. Um, both new market or low income housing tax credits, historic tax credits. Um, you know, it is, equity is a huge component of it. And uh, really the number you kind of back into the most is the debt. So that goes to the next point of creating a pro forma. So a pro forma on this, a financial analysis is another way to look at it, is after you have this thing built and one of your sources is the debt, are you going to have enough revenue to pay not just all of the operating expenses, <clears throat> property management, taxes, insurance, water, sewer, whatever else the owner is uh, on the hook to pay for, but are you going to have enough revenue after that to pay the interest and principal on the loan and to have enough cash flow to justify, well, if you're financial projections are wrong, that there's a buffer there to cover, you know, um, whatever that, that delta is between what you thought the revenue was going to be versus where it ended up. And that is, uh, so that all goes to the capital stack. They all tie in together. Um, you know, some projects uh, like our, our multifamily downtown, you know, you're looking at debt in the 20 to $25 million range. And the amount of debt is sometimes dictated not by what you think you can pay for, but by what the lender says you uh, can afford. You know, so it'll be their underwriting standards. Maybe they say you can only loan uh, 70 or 75% of loan to value, which is different from loan to cost. So you know they'll, they'll use an appraiser, they'll hire an appraiser and that appraiser will say, well, here, based on the amount of revenue you have, here's what the value of the building is. And then they'll take a you know, 70 or 75% of that amount. And that's how much you can, you can receive in a loan. 
assuming still that it meets all their other underwriting standards and assuming that you're comfortable that there'll be enough cash flow to pay that debt. Yeah, so it is a very much a balancing act and you know, everything from the length of the loan, the, the interest rate of the loan, whether it's fixed or floating, um, how often it can, it can change, uh, the amortization of the loan, which amortization is the length at which you have to pay the loan back. Um, on the way, not the length you have to pay the loan back in terms of the, so let me stop. There's the term of the loan, which is the length of the loan itself. So let's say you have a 10 year loan, that loan has to be paid back at the end of 10 years. But the amortization is the schedule of which that loan will be paid back. Ideal worlds, 10 year loan, 10 year amortization, you have paid down the principal of that loan so that on your last payment in the year 10, the loan is paid off at the same time that the term of the loan ends. A lot of times, and certainly this happens if you're using uh, Fannie or Freddie, which I'm hoping most of you have heard of as you know, the kind of quasi-governmental lenders. You, know, you might have a 10-year term, but a 35-year amortization, meaning that you're paying the principal down that at the end of 35 years, that loan is fully paid, but the loan itself is only 10 years. So you have to be thinking ahead of time, what's gonna happen in year eight, nine, 10? How are we gonna refinance? What are we going to do to pay that loan back? And, and many times it's, it's a refi and do another 10 and, and continue it on. But you know, some, some people are more aggressive than I am. I like to underwrite to lower amortizations, even if we end up with a higher one, uh, just because that means I know that worst case scenario, we have enough cash flow coming in that if we don't spend it all, we are creating opportunities um, to pay that loan back at the end of the term. So, you know, that's uh, another component of the capital stack and creating the pro forma that really goes to, again, all of these other components. They are also interrelated which that goes then to lease up and occupancy. Um, and I've, I've talked through a lot of this, so I'm just gonna keep moving forward. Uh, lease up and, and occupancy, you know, the biggest part of lease up in my mind, at least in uh, affordable and middle income housing is the price point. You know, it is, you know, in market rate housing, you're doing a lot more marketing. Um, you're offering, you know, free months of rent or, you know, maybe you're throwing in a TV, or you know, something else, uh, a gym membership to entice residents uh, that could afford to live in many different apartment complexes, you know, to come to your apartment complex versus someone else's. So you know, that's the lease up that happens with you know, the, the higher end um, uh, apartments. Uh, had a buddy uh, tell me he got three free months of rent in Chicago uh, if he'd signed by March 1st. And those those um, those deals are gone now because everyone is moving back uh, into the urban core in Chicago. So you know th those enticements come and go pretty quickly. On the affordable or kind of middle income side, you know, your marketing is really going to be primarily one letting people know that the project exists, which there are you know depending on the type of programming and there's requirements to do that. But you know those are those are easier marketing tools. The biggest part of the marketing is is the rental rates and the condition and amenities of the property. So, you know, we are, you know, if we're the one tax credit we're building right now, we're 10% below what the uh, market would otherwise bear, even in a tax credit environment. So, you know, we have pushed our rents low enough that we believe that there's not gonna be a 7% or 10% vacancy rate. There's gonna be such demand for these units because the units are, are pretty good and the rents are incredibly good you know, a one bedroom starting uh, under $600 a month in, in urban Columbus is, is a pretty great number uh, for a brand new unit, certainly. So, you know, those are the types of things that from the tax credit side, I, my experience has been the marketing is how good of a project can you make, not, not what other enticements you need to make for a project to work. Um, you know, depending on the type of project then is, you know, is it, is it family units? Is it the youth project? Is it you know, permanent supportive housing? You know, what type of service coordination and provision do you need? You know, so what are you, what are you looking for um, in terms of uh, you know, what the tenant population will require to be successful 
uh, as residents and then um, as they move forward into what may be their next uh, place of residence, whether that's buying a home or to a, you know, maybe a more expensive apartment complex, whatever. Uh, you know, and those things are everything from mental health and, and, and physical care on site or adjacent to a property. It could be transportation, um, food access, you know, it really depends on, on who you're serving. So as you're, again, as you're designing your project, as you're thinking about your capital stack, as you're thinking about your revenue, all of that ties back into the tenant population that you're serving and the services that you need to provide for that tenant population. You know, their development is much more of an art than it is a science, I think. And all of these things are incredibly interrelated. Um, you know, you can't just be, you know, in a silo. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. So, uh, you know, the service provider, the service coordinator needs to work with the property manager um, and that staff to, you know, there's going to be a competing interest there. The, the service coordinators are going to be the advocates for the tenants, the property managers. Sure, they're advocating for the tenants, but their primary responsibility is to have a healthy community and to keep the building in good shape. So if there's, you know, you might have a tenant that damages a property. Well, the, the service coordinator might be advocating for that tenant to stay. The property manager might want them evicted, you know, and those, those situations actually happen really often, especially in affordable or PSH or, you know, quasi PSH projects. Um, you know, and you, and you really try to figure out as the owner developer, you know, what is our goal and is this something we feel like we can address through mediation or is it something that is you know been an issue and is affecting other residents and has been for a long time you know those are the types of questions you're going to ask um you know and then the other thing and i i take some resentment to this you know we'll talk about a tax credit closing uh which is or, or you know a, a closing on a project which is really the beginning of the deal it's it's the closing is where all of the equity and the, the financing comes together and all of the paperwork and sometimes it's massive and can take months to get to if not years you know the paperwork is signed and all of a sudden there's an an issuance to the contract they say go build this or, or go renovate this um you know the closing is the very first step everything after that then becomes what's important. First, it's, you know, getting it done on schedule and on, on budget, getting your certificate of occupancy. So, you know, if it's, if you're in a rural part of Ohio, you're working with the state departments on that and maybe a local fire marshal. Uh, if you're in Columbus, that's all handled uh, at, the, at the building department here in Columbus. And a lot of cities actually have a hybrid, uh, Athens, review the plans and specs from a zoning perspective, but won't look at it from the building code uh, perspective. They have adopted and used the state for those. So, you know, each, each community, each city deals with things a little bit differently. Their inspection process during construction is a little bit different. I mean, honestly, this could be, you know, you could have a, a whole session, multiple sessions on, on the specific uh, location that you're in. So that's why you want to make sure you hire people that have an understanding of where you're working and why. So after you get through the certificate of occupancy, you've gone through the marketing, you've got the property leased up, things are looking good, you've got some cash flow coming in, you know, everyone's happy. The next thing and the important part is asset management. And that really is a wide range of what that means. That can be everything from making sure you have sufficient reserves being pulled every year to ensuring that you have proper insurance in place, to meeting whatever financial covenants you have um, with a lender. So you may have put up guarantees as an entity or an individual on the project, you know, basically saying that if something were to happen and the loan isn't being repaid, you have to not just give them the property, but actually have recourse where they come to you to make up the difference of whatever that could be. And, Sometimes that can be huge. You know, hopefully you're you're converting into a loan product that is non-recourse. But those are the those are the types of things that you want to look to as part of asset management. And something that can trick people up is well, you have one guarantee out there. You go to start another project. One project's going really well. You go to start another project, and you put up another guarantee for this new deal. 
and that violates the covenants with your lender for the first deal. I mean, those are things you want to make sure. I mean, that's all part of asset management. That's, you know, organizational management as well. So those are things you want to look to, um, you know, as, as, you're, as you're figuring out what you're doing with your existing portfolio and how you're going to grow. Um, you know, more, more detailed parts of asset management are, um, you know, as you get into tax credits where, you know, you're looking at things of credit delivery um, and you're looking at different uh, investor covenants of having sufficient operating reserves. And if you had drawn down some of those reserves, have you replenished them in the time frame that they require? Did you have sufficient basis? I mean, there's, you know, it gets into very technical um, items around the, um, uh, the IRS code, the IRC at section 42, you know, that you have to, you have to make sure that you continually meet on a year after year basis. Um, you know, I, I haven't uh, been around long enough in my jobs to deal with too much of the asset management on the long term, which is pretty good and pretty lucky because honestly, you know, between the legal side, the financial side, the developments, construction oversight, you know, there's, as you get more and more units placed in service, asset management becomes really important. And thankfully we've been able to hire uh, competent accountants um, and consultants to, to handle that, you know, whether it's uh, your auditor who's also doing your tax returns, who's also filing any regulatory items on behalf of, of you and the other partners to, um, working with staff that just, you know, can go out on site and do spot inspections of, of units to make sure that the maintenance is being um, upkept and that, you know, the, the site conditions are, are still in good shape, that things, you know, the paving hasn't been shipped and that landscaping is still looking good. Uh, it's amazing how many projects we have been involved in, especially on what called it like the naturally occurring affordable housing, which is really just, you know, uh, from a lender perspective, class B or class C properties where the, where the owners have let the property manager just not do their job. And so have massive vacancies with, you know, with deferred maintenance across the board. Well, you know, those are opportunities for organizations like us to come in and preserve that housing, but to do it not so much because the project wasn't already affordable. It was because it wasn't being, per, it wasn't being performing. It wasn't performing well, uh, because there wasn't asset management. So, you know, those are, those are the things on the operation side. Um, and then, you know, uh, one last thing on the operations really is what's the exit strategy? You know, if it's a tax credit deal, what is your uh, year, uh, year 15 exit gonna be with your limited partner um, investor? Uh, you know, what is your refinance gonna look like? Um, you know, those are the, those are the types of uh, exits you're looking at there. You know, if you don't have tax credits though, or, you know, you don't have any other subsidy, you know, what is your, what's your uh, takeout, what's your return of your capital going to look like? You know, are you looking at a high valuation two or three years down the, down the road? Are you looking at a, you know, a, a new um, cash out refinance, right? Where you, the, the value of the building has gone up and you and I get your cash out and you can service the debt. Are you looking at a sale? If so, you know, who are you looking to to sell it? Um, you know, what types of fees are you budgeting in there so that you can make some, some money and get your, your time um, and costs recuperated? You know, those are, those are the things that, again, kind of go back to the beginning. It, it really ties into what are you looking to do long term. So, you know, th those are the operations. That's, that's the ongoing thing that's, you know, from let's say concept to, to building is maybe depending on the type of funding one to four years. If, you know, if it's a single family house and it's something you've done in the past, you know, maybe it's a few months to a year. If it's a tax credit deal, we have to submit multiple times. Maybe you're looking at four years, but after that is what are you doing with the property? And that could be owning it for 30 years. So you want to make sure that you have a good understanding from the beginning of what your long-term goals and objectives are and how to get there. Um, so I know that is, I mean, there's so much information and, you know, I'm sure other developers have different ways of looking at it, different ways of, of evaluating it. I personally 
if there's any piece of advice I'll leave before we start answering questions is I try to be really conservative on underwriting. I stress interest rates. I stress the amortization schedules that will be accepted. Um, I try to keep rents below what I, I'm pretty certain are attainable. Um, you know, and I look to third party reports and market analysts to, to support all of those numbers. Um, you know, I, I think if you stress the project um, and it still looks okay, then you're probably in good shape. I mean, if you stress the project and it looks really good, then something's probably wrong and you're missing something. Um, you know, it, and, or, or you're not stressing it enough. You know, maybe you're, you're just too high on your rents or, you know, your construction costs are just, you know, you're projected way too low. And, and right now in this market, it's good to have those stresses because lumber and everything else uh, is, is just going through the roof. Um, you know, PVC pipe, which is in all the plumbing stacks, you know, that, that has gone through the roof because of some coding shortage or regular regulations on how much coding can go into one certain factory at a time. I mean, there's all of these different items that are driving up construction costs, you know, at the same time that land costs have been going up for the last, you know, you know since really 2008. And, um, rents are, are starting to stabilize a little bit. You're seeing, you're not seeing three and 4% increases anymore. You're seeing, you know, one to two in, in many markets. So, you know, it, construction costs and, and, and operating costs are going up more than that. So you want to make sure you stress the project in a way that actually shows a realistic trend of what's happening in the markets. Um, if you do that and it looks pretty good or looks okay, uh, you're probably in a good shape to move forward. Um, I would always say they'll get a second set of eyes and another opinion on any project because you stare at it long enough, you believe in it enough, you think you can do anything. But, um, you know, again, no is, is one of your best friends when it comes to, to real estate development. So with that, Lisa, I don't know, I saw the chats have been popping up. I don't know if there are any questions to answer at this point or what do you think? Um, there are, we got some questions. I would encourage you to keep typing in questions. Um, I also would encourage you if you've been sitting this whole time to just like stretch because it's like really good, right? Um, it's your friendly reminder to stretch. Um, but uh, I'll start with this one. Um, would you, uh, would finance fund be able to help a small nonprofit with grant funding for affordable, affordable housing? I also want to tack on to that question. Um, what other sources would you generally suggest when you're looking for financing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So uh, the answer about finance fund is uh, possibly. Uh, we do have some grant funding uh, available in uh, pre-development grants specifically for housing uh, for uh, community development entities. So. You, know, you don't have to be uh, uh, registered as a CDC, but you have to have it in your bylaws that community development is part of your uh, is part of your activities, and and there's some other things there. So the answer is possibly on that. Um, but grant sources that are available, um, you know, depending on where you where you are, where you're trying to work, uh, you know, there's there's home funds, H O M E. It doesn't stand for anything. Uh, it's it's money from the federal government that uh, goes to um, uh, different jurisdictions, mostly municipalities, um, and then there's some uh, more balance of state items there. Uh, within home funds, there's something called CHODO funds, which are community housing development organization dollars that are uh, a little more regulated as the entities that can receive those. Um, different municipalities and organizations use those differently. Um, you know, there's philanthropic dollars, uh, other government grants at the county level, potentially. Um, you know, I'll be honest, and I, I think this is, you know, if, if this weren't said, this, you know, people would walk away frustrated. You know, the more, uh, the, the better capitalized um, cities have more resources to provide uh, for these gap sources. So, you know, in Columbus, you know, we, we received a ton of what was called NSP dollars back in 2010 and 11. Um, you know, and that's what allowed us to do a lot of our single family renovations and it actually was gap dollars in our tax credit projects. You know, Franklin County recently created a, uh, which is where Columbus is, uh, created um, 
a, a subsidy source gap dollars for 4% tax credit deals, you know, that help these projects work. You know, some rural areas aren't going to have any of those resources or, or not nearly as many of those resources. You know, what you're hoping then is that you can find that sweet spot of where something can be built and the rents can, can justify whatever that cost is. So, you know, yes, the, I would love to talk about that more. You know, a couple other sources, Federal Home Loan Bank, they're, they're a great partner. Um, you know, they certainly, their, their funds aren't free. They, you know, you, they're competitive. So, you know, you're committing yourselves to a lot of different components of a project. Um, but, you know, that if your deal works with what their program is, you know, those are up to a million dollar grant. You know, so that can be hugely impactful. Um, you know, certainly tax credit deals, uh, you know, those can you know, bring a sufficient amount of equity. Oftentimes, sometimes you still need some other sources in there uh, that maybe OFA can help provide. If not, maybe, a, you know, another organization can. Um, so, you know, there's, there's no magic wand for this, but, you know, if anything, we have seen a huge influx of of new uh, grants uh, that are coming up uh, because of some of the, the new laws uh, and regulations that have been passed in the last couple of months. So really exciting to see that you know, housing authorities and others are, are going to have more capital. Um, and so to that point, don't always look at it from the, from the capital stack, capital expense side. You know, if you can get vouchers uh, and that can pay for, you know, maybe a higher rental rate than what you think you might be able to get from the market or it brings down the vacancy rate, you know, that is another way where maybe you can service more debt. So, you know, there are certainly other ways to, to make these projects work. Thank you. Um, I mean, there's a question about having, have you done work in Cleveland? We have, uh, we've invested in Cleveland in a, in a few different projects. Um, we're actually part of, um, it's called Chase Pro Neighborhoods now, where we're collaborating with three uh, CDCs in three neighborhoods in Cleveland um, and are helping them through with some of their tax credits and community development projects, um, helping them get capital, providing them some grant dollars. So. Yeah, we, we certainly have a lot of, we actually have staff people that live in Cleveland. So we have a lot of experience up there um, and are looking at a couple middle income projects right now to invest in. Thanks. And you do work around the whole state, right? We do. Yeah. Yeah. And we have, uh, as a development uh, investor and, and developer and real estate developer, we've got projects in Athens, Cincinnati, um, downtown Columbus to some of the, the suburbs and are, are looking uh, in Northern Ohio now too. Great. Um, I will speak, this is, this is a good question actually. Does uh, Ohio CDC, we don't, uh, or finance fund have a pro forma that are used for educational purposes and can be shared? So finance fund doesn't, I, I have a very basic one. Um, that I, I created on my own for some of my own investments and developments. I'm certainly happy to share that. I've shared that with other people. Um, you know, it's, it's a basic one. If you want something more, honestly, some of these developers have 30 page um, pro formas that are looking at you know, tax consequences 15 years down the road. I'm not smart enough for that. I, I, I'm a four or five page Excel doc and you know, that's, that's how I, I, I work. So, um, I, I, I struggle to read some of those more uh, intricate performance and I would love somebody to teach me how to do those. Um, but I certainly can share that, you know, the more basic ones that show sources and uses and cash flow. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I might ask you for that when we send out the notes. Sure. You cash it if you're cool with that. Okay. Thanks. Um, and if you want, um, I think that's a good question. If you want more help with that, I know a couple of years ago at our conference, Doug Harson, he did a 20 minute power session on pro formas. Um, and if you don't know him, um, I can help connect you if you're looking in that space. Uh, he's a consultant. Um, and then uh, what would be, what would be my first step uh, if I wanted to get grant funding from finance fund? Uh, send me an email. 
and I'll put you in contact with uh, the staff that oversee those grants. And I will be sending out Jeff's email um, when I send out the recording. So you should get that by the yeah, end of the week, but reasonably probably this afternoon. It's on um, this last slide too. So if you guys can see my screen still, it's right there. Jaywoman at financefund.org. Great. It's also very much, uh, Finance Fund is really good for listing their staff's emails on their websites. I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> who are you working with in Cleveland, which CDCs? Uh, so we're working in the, the Glenville, um, Buckeye and uh, Clark Fulton neighborhoods. Uh, so uh, Famicos, uh, Burton Bell Carr and um, uh, Metro West are the three CDCs that are in those neighborhoods. And then um, question about where is the loan application for the finance fund capital core? Yeah, you know, I actually don't think we have um, a loan application on our website, um, but we, we have a loan officer. His name is uh, James Henson. Um, if you either, you can either reach out directly to him if you can get his email from the website. I think it's J Henson. Um, at financefund.org or email me and um, he'll send over kind of a checklist of things that they, they might look for. And it, it really kind of depends on what the project is. You know, we do everything from small business loans to, you know, multifamily tax credit projects. So there's not kind of a one size fits all application. Um, I guess uh, Again, great questions, guys. Keep typing them in because we do have, you know, a few more minutes. Um, as you're typing them in, I guess if you're totally, like if I'm a CDC and I'm totally new to this space and I know you've given so much information, which is great, we can um, we can access it later. But like, what is the one, the biggest piece of advice if for like a brand new, like we we're doing this? Yeah, um, site control. So. If there's anything that I wish I would have known more of is that the more properties you have control of, the more you can influence the conversation of the neighborhood. So if you're a CDC that's trying to create a certain aesthetic, a certain appeal, a certain you know, uh, benefit to existing residents, you know, what, whatever, whatever it is in a certain pocket of a neighborhood or maybe throughout the neighborhood, you know, if, you're, if you're a CDC, smaller CDC, maybe don't have a ton of capital, and you're on the sidelines just trying to advocate, you know, you're not going to be heard as well as if you can actually get control of those properties. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have all the capital. Maybe it's you have agreements to purchase these, these properties, or maybe you partner with someone, maybe like a finance fund, maybe another developer for profit and, and bring those entities in early. Um, I, I think the most impactful CDCs uh, have been the ones that are able to secure and own property. And quite honestly, that's one of the ways that Finance Fund was so influential when we started our development. The first thing we did was we tied up a bunch of property, um, like the Carroll Street Village property and a couple of other um, pieces of land that really allowed us to, to have a say, uh, you know, to be at the conversations for these communities because now we're one of the larger landholders in it. So, um, you know, certainly we were trying to do good work, but you know, if if we were just on the on the outside advocating, I don't think you know our voice would have been heard as well. Thank you for that. Um, and Brittany, Brittany Bolton from the Finance Fund, being super helpful in the chat. I'll put this in the notes too. Uh, for loan inquiries, uh, send it to grow at financefund.org. Thanks, Brittany. Um, Brittany being awesome. Uh, I think. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, again, if you have more questions, um, Jeff is super accessible and I'm sure he'll answer them um, if you reach out to him one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but I wanna kind of start to wrap it up um, and thank, thank Jeff again and each of you uh, for joining us in this session, especially those of you who were here at the top and it was kind of chaotic with the chat function. Appreciate your patience, super great. Um, but yeah, I will send the recording out with the slides and, and additional notes by the end of the week. Um, and of course, if there's anything um, that you think Ohio CDC Association can do for you or you just want, want to get a question answered, 
please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, but as we're closing out, um, kind of wrapping it up, I would like to make, uh, pass it over to Jeff as like kind of our final actual closing word of encouragement. Uh, and if you want to take us out on something wonderful and encouraging, Jeff. Yeah, uh, so I've been thinking about that, Lisa, since you asked me to do that whatever, on Monday. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges in the world right now. Of course, there's the, the headlines are pretty rough and, and, and pretty dark at times. Um, you know, and, and quite frankly, sometimes it can feel hard to be all that encouraged. But, you know, I think one of the things I am most encouraged about is that at the end of the day, the work that we're trying to do here, it's not just, it's not about the bricks and sticks. It's not about, you know, the, uh, the revenue and all the dollars and all the behind the scenes uh, things that happen. It's, it's about the, the food that we provide access to. It's about the jobs that we can uh, provide that will impact families. And, you know, specifically for me, it's about the individuals and families that didn't have a home before that are now housed. And from that, you know, the world of opportunity has just drastically opened for them. So, you know, be encouraged by the work that you're doing that, you know, it's hard and sometimes it can feel even ugly um, and frustrating, but at the end of the day, it is truly trying to serve and impact um, individuals and families that absolutely are going to be bettered by the work you do. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.